here. You're one of my favorite alternative researchers, for lack of a better term, I guess. And uh, I'll, of course, provide a preface and an introduction for you when this episode goes online, but I'd rather just skip the formalities and jump into some of the questions, because I already know the material is very diverse and involved. And, uh, you know, we're just going to scratch the surface. So, I mean, is that all right with you? Let's go. Yeah, that's great. Um, sure. I'm, I have no problem with that. Well, you know, a lot of your work is on symbolism and the meaning behind certain events. And I wanted to hear your perspective on two of the biggest events recently being the royal wedding and the apparent death of bin Laden. And uh, ask if you see any significance in them, symbolically. Well, yeah, there's, an, there's not just that, but there's a lot of other things going on. I mean, one has to say before you even start speaking in a conspiratorial angle, just from a, almost a layman's point of view, these kinds of fiascos are there just to, you know, again, either edify people, keep them distracted, or to uh, tr traumatize them. So we have a, you know, sort of a good cop, bad cop, hot coal situation going in which they know that now that they've reduced the human race to the absolute um, lowest common denominator of intellect, that then you're just on this sort of um, slaveocracy level in which everything that comes, every, every, a, good, a good portion of people's reality, so to speak, is a hyper reality, a fantasy reality, a pseudo reality. Um, just in the same way that young kids would play with soldiers, you know, and we grow up playing games. Uh, once you've been reduced to the infantile level, you're still in that fantasy realm, even if you may be 40 years of age or whatever it might be. So, you know, royal weddings, wars, you know, uh, dramas, it's all just big, a theater. The world is just a theater in which you have your guys with the black caps and the guys with the white caps, you know, and there's this whole... It, 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 so much of our world anyway today, so much of, of what we see isn't perceived in reality, is perceived through some digital medium. Obviously what I mean there is the television and the cinema and the news and all the rest of it. So a lot of these things are just played out on one of the most basic level is just simply bread and circuses for the masses. Yeah, that's on the most basic level. Then what you're hinting at though is the more subtle um, levels where there may be some ritualistic elements that are much more esoteric and much more deep and of course I do track that it's a full-time job and no doubt about it that any time that the equinox spring equinox comes up you're going to have major rituals there's no surprise that this last attack on Libya was again at the feast of Purim in March that it was time for the crossing over point of uh, the uh, spring equinox and the date that usually describes the spring equinox is, you know, March 22nd, which is 322, which is the famous large number of the Skull and Bone Society. So that's just one reason. Um, the most important one is the actual physical rising of the sun over the, the equinox. It's an enormously important time. That's also why in America, you guys are from the States, you know that tax time is around that period. Why? You know, why would tax time, what are taxes? You know, that's the slave. Uh, producing his uh, wages. Why is it handed over at that time? That's because the stars of Libra are in the sky at that time and, and the sign of Libra is related to the scales which it tax people used to come around to door to door in the old days even right up to the medieval time. Their logo or their emblem over their doors and also they would physically carry one around was a big scales, a large scales. You'll even hear about this in the Bible with uh, Matthew, the tax collector. And the symbol of the tax collectors from that time immemorial has been this uh, large scales. You know when you used to balance rice and beans and gold and all that. And it just turns out that the stars of the scales, that's Libra, is in the sky very prominently around about this time of the year. And that's one of the reasons why the tax, the collectors, so to speak, you know, the IRS or whatever, come out to, to do that. So there's, there's, it's just a welter of symbolism that they're using both in their corporate logos and their timing of things. And you're speaking now about two very specific events that, uh, yeah, I, I even heard that the so-called, you know, assassination of bin Laden there is, is almost on the same day as the birth of Adolf Hitler. It, it's very close to the time of the World Illuminati Celebration Day, May 15th, you know. Um, and then most importantly, there's a couple of other important astrological things that one needs to know about this time. And that's why the royal wedding has uh, been uh, timed now. 
Uh, one small anecdote about the royals is that the Queen of England, whose birthday is actually in May, always traditionally has celebrated it in the sign of Gemini. So she's a Taurus, but she celebrates her birthday in Gemini. Um, you'll find this kind of displacement quite a lot. There was a Prince Charles uh, did it also, uh, it, but I can't remember the incident in which he did it where a certain f festival or celebration, this was close to the time of Lady Spencer's killing, uh, some sort of celebration was marked for October, but it didn't actually happen until later than that. And sometimes they do this because, again, they're, they're very conscious of lunar time and sidereal time. But the two events I was going to speak about that happen in May is one is that the Milky Way begins there. In stellar astrology, the Milky Way begins between the signs of um, Taurus and Gemini and run all the way across the zodiac to Sagittarius and Scorpio, just like a sort of a large bridge or a river. And in fact, in ancient days, the Milky Way was re was referred to as the as the River Styx, as the river of the Pharaoh or the river, the sacred river. And therefore, that is running very close to this period right now. And a lot of the world's traditions, including the Maya, Aztec, Egyptian, Celtic, you name it, have been precisely um, arranged for this particular time. Very important celebrations, I might add. And then, uh, for instance, uh, this particular, what they call collier, or cusp, as it's now referred to, between the signs of Gemini and Taurus is important because that's where we get the word uh, Minotaur. And the whole Grecian myth of the hero going into the underworld to face the so-called Minotaur, it's actually a play on words. Minai being Gemini, right, the end of Gemini, and Tor being the beginning of the word Taurus. So Minotaur, facing the Minotaur. This is how these myths and legends, fairy tales, folk tales, are created as veneer for astrotheological st stories, uh, traditions that are only known to the initiates. The people who create the movies know this. They're still doing the same thing. That's why half the movie companies of the world have the stellar symbolism on their graphics at the very beginning, be it TriStar or Disney or I don't, I don't care what. They're all aware of this stuff, you see. So that's another important portal point uh, that happens in Taurus. Um, and so a lot of these things will be coordinated for this. But then the third, and I think the most important thing to realize about rituals that happen in May, is that uh, just as I said that during tax time the stars of Libra are prominent, well, in the period of Taurus and Gemini where we are now, it's the stars of the 13th sign of the zodiac, Ophiuchus. It's actually on the other side of the zodiac, but at night its constellations are in the sky. So right now, why things are very important is because that 13th sign under which so much ritual is done from this uh, point of view, if you're talking about the secret brotherhood, the Black Lodge, the Illuminati, therefore they're going to always target very important relationships, uh, very important um, ceremonies at this time uh, because of the presence in the sky of uh, Ophiuchus, the 13th sign. And that's an entire study in itself. So that's one thing to be looking into. Uh, is the, the presence of the 13th sign that's happening right now. Are we just carrying on an old tradition with these things, or is there an astrological draw, or is this just part of the control scheme? Um, it's more, it's a mixture of all. It, it, they, they do this in exactly the same way as you would look at a wristwatch. It's that automatic. It's that unconscious in some sense. Um, of course, the planning is conscious and what have you, but uh, what I'm talking about is the ideology, the idea that you should use the cosmological symbolism to protect you, to work with. I mean, you know, I've gone blue in the face talking about uh, to my members of Time Gnosis that they all, you know, who are members of that system using even the most basic numerology for their day-to-day -day business affairs and so on. And people get back to me saying, you know, they see incredible, uh, they're actually come almost speechless with the amount of uh, empowerment that they get from that kind of system. Well, that's just, you know, a, 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 that's just a module we've created that's a very simplistic, but you know, brilliant system, think about if you had centuries of knowledge that you could draw upon, that you were, that your advisors, you know, high grade astronomers and astrologers, people who knew so much intimate details about symbolism, about numerology, about uh, divination and so on, and alchemy and what have you. So obviously when they have this great power they want to use it they're they're very clever in that sense and that's why they maintain the power that they have because really they're not able to maintain it in other ways if we look at history we'll see that they've had great setbacks as well 
They've not only had great infighting, these royals and these dynasties, but, uh, you know, times have changed. Like if you examine what happened in the aftermath of the First and Second World War, the rise of the labor parties, the rise of uh, the common man to be educated and so on, they've had major setbacks. They've had to make a lot of concessions. And they've had to scale back their overt power. What I'm saying is that the way that they used to maintain power by way of the whip and by some baron sitting on his, in his mansion with, you know, an army of slaves. I mean, those days are over, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't maintain that anymore. So they had to scale that back somewhat. But these are very cunning people who know that ultimately, even though you may have to scale that back or you may have to downsize or whatever, doesn't mean you necessarily have to go out of business. You just become more cunning at it and uh, more structured at it. And we know this is a, an absolute fact because we see the same thing happening in the Balkans now. After the fall of communism, exactly what I'm saying took place, where you have in the Balkans, after the communists, you had many of the aristocratic, oligarchical families of the old days, you know, the old Austro-Hungarian Empire and all of these people who've been living in London since the rise of communism, their daughters and sons, very aristocratic people, have gone back to, you know, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria to set up shop. Even some of them have moved back into ancestral homes. That's the palaces that are still there, albeit dilapidated. And what's the very first thing that happens? Is that all the local yokels, right, who used to be slaves, their fathers used to be slaves under these oligarchs, are now laying out red carpets and tipping their caps to these Slavic oligarchs, just so glad to have them back now that the, the you know, the rotten communists have disappeared. Welcome, your highness, and we'll be glad to bend our backs and pick your potatoes and, and do your grapes for you, you know, and create your vineyards. Like, nothing has ever happened. They're actually begging for oligarchy to come back. So let's not forget that that's exactly the same paradigm as in the West. If these Western oligarchs, pompous bastards that they are, if they could get away with an army of Irish laborers and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, slave labor, they'd still be doing it, you know, take my word for it. It's just that they weren't able to get that, so they have to then use other means to secure their power. And one of those is the use of this incredible archive of symbolism to befuddle, to mind control, to create situations in which people start auto-hypnotizing themselves. Uh, astrology is a part of it, of course. And that's why you will have the flag-waving yokel, you know, Joe Smoes coming out, waving their flags, you know, still to this day, or even worse, donning uniforms to go out and be murdered and, and to murder in the name of these oligarchs or the institutions that these oligarchies control. Uh, my work exposes what these institutions are. People can go to my forum. They can contact me to find out the network of royal orgs. You know, I have a, on my forum a, a uh, page there called Empire of Death. People only need to go to that and start reading that, meticulously study the links that I put up there, and they will find just how vast this oligarchical network is, even though it may be somewhat in the background hiding behind charities, institutions like medical and uh, educational and, and uh, philanthropic. It's the same story you have in America with the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, you know, the Rand Institute, the Brookings Institute. All of these orgs are royal. They are, they're offshoots of the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Mount Perlin Society and so on and so forth or the Club of the Isles and all of these Alpha Lodges of Freemasonry. And they've been slowly moving into the American milieu. They carry the symbolism that's almost identical to that which is used by the, the oligarchs of England. And they did that through your American constitution and through the founding fathers who are nothing less than British agents for the most part. Mm -hmm. Most of the founding fathers were Freemasons, correct? Yeah. yeah. Almost all of them. Yeah. And, and pe people have to realize that when they say that, they've got to understand that Saying Freemason doesn't really tell you that much. Some of these people were not only Freemasons, but very high degree Freemasons. That's the point. Mm -hmm. They were not just your common, you know, like your dad or my dad going down to the lodge, you know, that, that kind of thing, uh, you know, having a few drinks and all that. It's a whole different world, yeah. Oh, yes, it's a totally different world. So always have to add that point that, number one, I'm not indicting normal Freemasons in, this, in, in, in any sense, nor am I uh, indicating that these people are of your normal, traditional Freemasonic type that the local, you know, pub owner or the local, you know, governor, or even to that extent, uh, you know, police chief or whatever, it's far, far higher than that. These people come from dynastic families, Livingstone, Menzies, oh my God, you know, the list goes on of, of these families, the Sinclairs and uh, the Kelloggs and, and uh, you know, whatever. All, there's so many families, the bloodline families, really. I, uh, I mean, I'm pretty, 
I'm pretty vested in your work, and I had Dave watch uh, Architects of Control just recently, and we also watched a little bit of uh, Age of Manipulation, which is, I believe, a nine-hour series. Something like that, yeah. Is, it's great, but considering that this information is kind of new to a large part of my audience, um, can you sort of broadly talk to us about the history of the control and some of the major lies we've been told, in, including our origins? And uh, I also was always curious, is like, what was what is really the point outside of, I guess, control to hide that information from us? Because you could tell us a real history in some ways and uh, really just with an economic model still enslave us. Well, slavery is a, what you are talking about is slavery. Right. But slavery is ultimately a, a model that doesn't work unless you have hierarchy. So mm -hmm. when you start studying one thing, like say slavery, oh, look at you know just my nine to five job, I'm locked in there, or I hate my boss, or look at who I am in this university, I've tried my best, but all these guys above me. You know, whatever way you, the little man starts to already start asking questions that lead one thing to another, it's like I've always described it as pulling a little thread, then the red thread becomes a string, the string becomes a rope, the rope becomes a chain, and the next thing you know, you've got a big you know, whale in your living room. Mm -hmm. So these things, one leads to the other, and then you start studying slavery, uh, or debt slavery, or what have you, and then you start moving up to say, yeah, who are these corporations, and then you go beyond, and you start finding out about these uh, secret societies that are all over the world, and these chivalric orders, and their antiquity, and then somebody like me would say, oh, wait a minute, you know, as you said from the beginning, the symbolism tells you, well, that's kind of crazy, because this is a lot of Egyptian symbolism, it's a lot of Jude, what appears to be Jewish symbolism, oh, how, why is that, how, why, how does that work, and you know, one thing keeps leading to the other, and then you start finding it, it goes deeper and deeper, um, all the way back to Babylon, you know, the monetary system, back to Rome, the symbolism, all of this goes all the way back to Egypt, and you start tracking all of this, and the moment that you're getting wiser and wiser, and the moment you're getting smarter and smarter on this, or let's just use the symbolism I use a lot of a mountain, you're getting higher and higher, there's a dark side, and that is you're getting further and further away from the people that you grew up with, right. intellectually. Right? So, yeah. just as you're about to uh, turn around and go, hey guys, you know, here, I can give you a handle on what's going on here, and this can be in a, even a quite small way, you know, nobody wants to hear. So then that apathy starts taking you yet in another direction, and what I mean by that, of course, is then you're into the study of psychology. Because now you have to say that there's a relationship between the slave and the master. It's not just a straight situation of control. We tried to, I'm speaking like this because you jogged my memory about the Architects of Control DVD where we went into this more than at other times, mm -hmm. in which we start to try and point out that this is um, a slave-master uh, relationship. And that can't be understood at all until you understand what it is in the mind of the slave that wants to have the master, wants to obey authority. You know, this takes you into then a lot of what to me is more fascinating information because as you well know most of the people in the conspiracy folk uh, or the uh, people who are into revisionism will put the focus mostly on that overt control mm -hmm. as and, and they're implying by that that the slave actually would love to be free see i've never believed this i actually believe that it's a relationship just in the same way that you can hear them say it i mean you listen to all this huxley and people like that to be glad to tell you this that man has been a slave and he's almost a, he's an instrument in his own enslavement. Uh, the, what has happened down through the centuries is that the slave has just exchanged chains of iron for chains of gold, metaphorically speaking. You know, if he can have a bitter, a bit uh, uh, less uh, punitive treatment, he'll be, he'll be okay with that. He doesn't really want to leave the walls of the prison. Right. So a person like me is standing there saying, but the gates can be opened, wide open, and you can all leave. And they're all sitting there going, no, you leave. We don't, we want, we're happy here. So then what happens is this road then takes you into a study of psychology and the dynamics of consciousness and what have you. And then you start putting your finger on the very uh, nexus of it, the very nub of this whole problem that you then see played out in this in society or played out in politics, whereas that it's a relationship between the slave and the master. And you understand then the brilliance of the controller, the, the big brother, so to speak, as that term has been used, because they're aware of this. As you start getting really clever with this, because you, you realize that the slave doesn't want to really be free, and that if he gives up one set of chains, he just buys into another one, 
Um, then you start to understand that it's the slave master who has understood this. This is part of the occult knowledge that they use. So one angle of this could take you into studying ancient history as a historian, but another direction can take you into studying philosophy or say even psychology and keep it contemporary, keep it you know, uh, contemporary to what's happening now. Yeah, now I mean, obviously you need to do both as much as possible, but for me the more intriguing aspect is the psychology because then you're kind of understanding, you're seeing through their eyes, you're seeing through the eyes of the master. If the master can create a situation in which his slave is auto-hypnotized, my God, then the game is up because the, the slave is doing his own hypnotizing. He's completely on remote control, as we spoke about in the DVD. And, and, and then when you, now I'm going to move on to, to talk about remedies to these problems, a person like myself who's made a study of this is no longer really convinced that political change is really going to work. We don't rule it out, but we are certainly not as, 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 as uh, optimistic about that kind of change. We understand now that the change has to take on an individual psychological level. That's where the Gordian knot is. As I said, a lot of this master-slave relationship stuff can be found even on a day-to-day -day basis, in the place of work, or even in the home, uh, certainly in the relationship of parents to children and teachers and society to the young and all the rest of it, and then ultimately, internally, the, the, the relationship that we have with our own selves internally. So, and what I mean by that is, that, see, it's a strange quirk of human nature that as soon as you're born, you have two enemies, so to speak, two adversaries. One is the utter world of all of its, uh, you know, quandaries and tribulations and stimuli. You have to defend against that. You've got to negotiate all of that, all the ups and downs and, and uh, shenanigans of the external world in order to stay sane and to be able to function. But we're also, as human beings, have this internal world, what apparently is the subjective world to deal with, you know, our own complexes, our own syndromes. So human beings stand on the sort of twilight zone between an external um, world that's threatening and uh, impenetrable, so, so to speak, and you have this internal world. And the masters at the top of the ladder know all about this. And one of the methodologies that then they use to keep people in a state of total uh, lockdown is this trauma and the constant fear and the constant anxiety, knowing full well that if you create a lot of external uh, tribulation of whatever kind it may be, hidden and, and more obvious, that will have a psychological consequence in which the person themselves is just literally drowning, you know, in anxiety. And it's through this fear equals anxiety uh, dynamic that the greatest uh, control operates, really. Yeah, when, when you mentioned the trauma, uh it makes me think about, I've seen in your work and other work as well from, uh, you know, Jordan Maxwell or David Icke, a lot of this is, is ancient trauma that comes from the origins of our species, which is, it's interesting that all biblical, all ancient texts talk about, you know, gods coming from the sky and like, to me, I can completely see that being extraterrestrials and not gods. Um, there's, in translation, that would be hard to differentiate between the two. And, it is. Uh, also, it's interesting that we're the only being I know of that has two chromosomes fused into one slot, and I don't see that anywhere in nature. Exactly. There's so many bizarreties about the human being. Uh, I've written about these in the Atlantis book, gone into great detail on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I would say that even if you just start from a non-conspiratorial point of view, which means if you can't buy into the idea of alien invasion or whatever, just the very fact of earth changes, just the very fact of cataclysm in a physical sense. There are many authors who have written about this who haven't the faintest idea about conspiracy, and yet they still conclude that the mind was traumatized. One of those people is Julian James, um, you know, the great scientist. So, and he's not the only one. So there's people from within the traditional world who have accepted that um, psychologically man suffered a major trauma. There's actually a whole school of these people. I refer to them in my DVD and book. Their names are right there for people to follow that up who have actually concluded that man is a traumatized being. They all have sort of different takes on what caused the trauma, but they somewhat agree that some sort of earth changes, whether it was desertification, lack of rain, or it might have been volcanoes, or it might have been, you know, the biblical flood. Some of them even do believe in that, that through the work of Emmanuel Velikovsky and others, and Commons Beaumont and, and others, they do recognize that the world was, you know, rent by enormous disasters. So even if you don't buy into an extraterrestrial, um, presence, it still is factual enough to say that the earth itself, through plague, through famine, through cataclysm, through tidal waves and tsunamis and even a pole shift, all, all of this is now coming to light in, in very recent times, 
that alone will, will convince an open-minded person that something enormous took place to the psyche of man. In my opinion, there's no doubt about it. There can't be any doubt about it. And it is good to see that now uh, David, for one, has been talking about that. And his latest work is uh, l looking into the cataclysm somewhat. Mm -hmm. And that, that's great because I insist that it needs to be studied. You know, it's the center of my work. And it's very important to understand that that particular original biological uh, uh, physiological and both psychological trauma aided and abetted the masters later on. They, they know about it. They know that the psyche is fragmented. They probably know a great deal about it. And they have said, well, listen, that happened fortunately. So all we got to do is sort of maintain a constant uh, culture of trauma in order to bring in whatever agenda they're doing. They bring it in on the back of that, of wars, of famines, of poverty, of, of tremendous social injustice, and then the psychological versions of disorders that are rampant all over the world. If the mind is already schizoid in its very origin, if what we have as today's consciousness is schizoid in its origin, um, then it's very simple to create yet further forms of you know, schizo, uh, schizophrenia in human beings. And then since human beings, through their life force, through their energy, create the societies that go on to then create the social, sociological setting, obviously those societies will then be schizogenic. And then it becomes a feedback loop. The, the schizogenic societies create yet further children who are polarized, fragmented, narrow, uh, spiritless, whatever you want to call it. And then they go on to create yet more. So that's why we're heading towards this post-human world. That's in a long time in the making. And it doesn't happen just through one thread. It's very deeply disturbed people. Uh, to the point where now they're even wanting to shut down emotion. People are not in any way attuned to their own emotions, for goodness sake. You know, and then that, that brings up a huge uh, big pharma leviathan to take care of that again. Because what man will do, and what man has been traditionally doing, and one thing we must insist is that you're going to see more of this as we count down to 2012 and beyond. What I'm going to say now is going to be increasing as the years go by. But it has been happening in the past all down through the ages, is that when a human being has that inner anxiety I was talking about, where they have to confront all the inner syndromes and complexes, one of the methodologies that the ego uses to offset responsibility or to just escape that inner trauma is to project it outwards. Is to simply say that the reason for all their disorderly feelings or this um, feeling of anxiety or stress or whatever it might be, it's externally it's because of this and that and the other. It's because of the economy. It's because of the wars. It's because of, you know, relationships or whatever. Man will always find ways to project his inner angst onto the external world, place the blame there, and then step back. And then again, want some authority figure to come in and lead them or guide them or, or fix it. So we have this problem as well. Is what's called the transference, the displacement or the sublimation. And people not taking personal responsibility for their consciousness or their lives and then happily, in some sense of the word, projecting it outwards, uh, and then either going to some high priest in the sense of even religion, or the high priests of psychology or psychiatry. Well, that's another master-slave relationship. This is the dynamic that happens when people have lost so much of their own power. Hmm? Everyone's looking for an expert. Yes, and that's all right to a degree. Naturally, there are experts who are smarter than us, and it's good to, to, to find out what they have to say, but not to the extent where you've given up completely the reins of your own thinking, your own biology, and even to a certain extent your own bioenergetics. Your own bioenergetic energy is no longer under your own control. Somebody else rules almost every aspect of your life uh, in the same way that a dominating parent controls every single aspect of the child's life to the extent where the child becomes neurotic. Because if a parent... Um, Let's just use this metaphor of the parents. The child is already put into a state of neurosis because it's scared that if it does a bad deed, it will lose the love of its parents. I mean, this is just psychology 101, right? Mm -hmm. So child fears, oh, yeah, I don't want to do bad things um, because the parent will get angry or the parent will get cold or the parent might reprimand me and the parent might, even in the most extreme case, lose love. And I'll lose that security and I'll lose that love of my parent, right, the authority figure, so that's what causes the child to then do good, so to speak. And many psychologists have argued, is the child really doing good out of its own true actual moral, you know, nature, or is it because it knows it's going to get punished? But that's a separate thing we don't need to go into. All we need to look at is that there is this uh, feeling. And then the child's acts of badness, what, what would constitute one of those acts of badness? 
rebellion, outright aggression. If the child is already worried about a mere infraction bringing the disapproval of the parent, the child is fully aware that if it acts completely aggressively or stands up against the parent for even the parent's misdemeanors, it will suffer an incredible wave of retaliation, right? So what then happens is in the child's mind, the next level of repression is of the aggressive instincts. And see, what my message is that these aggressive instincts are not all necessarily bad. When something rotten is happening to you, you should act aggressively. You should not be all right with it. But very early on as children, we learn that any act of aggression whatsoever will be immediately cause enormously painful reactions. You know, like, like I say, the complete loss of love from a parent, let alone all these other consequences that might happen. So the instinct of aggression, which is a natural bioenergetic um, um, response, to the violation of your integrity and the violation of your selfhood, you repress it in order to identify with the master, to identify and get their approval. So in other words, you're willing to accept any kind of tyranny and, and even accept the approval of that tyranny because you've repressed your own instinct of aggression and that act of aggression might have been as a defense against the violation of your selfhood. So this is what we see when then we take a step forward and move into the political world or into the sociological world, that's what we have. We have a world of smiling depressives, each one of us seeking the approval of others, and, and, there's, and it's a soft tyranny that is taking place. And the moment that any individual, and this, and this is the crux of the matter, and people who are going to think deeply about what I'm going to say now, they will have a big, big piece of the answer here. And that is that the anxiety exists when any kind of show of selfhood emerges. So in other words, that the, ver the person who has repressed their instincts, the person who has completely self-mutilated their own selfhood, their anxiety is not a true anxiety, right? Their stress is not a true stress. It's the stress of that selfhood, which doesn't go away, trying to re-emerge healthfully. So the person's own neurosis, the person's own disorders, of which we know the world is awash in, is actually a pseudo-anxiety, a pseudo-despair, a pseudo-distress, because you're actually been repressing your selfhood. And that selfhood being a natural, organic, spiritual thing doesn't die. You can repress it, but it doesn't go away. Anytime that it tries to reemerge in whatever form, that now causes your anxiety. So the anxieties of the world today and the stresses of the world today are actually based on their, on their true voice trying to make a reemergence. So it's incredible how this thing works. And therefore, you're actually self-mutilating yourself. It's the self-murder that I talk about incessantly, the self-sadism that's going on. And you do it to get the approval of these slave masters who are pretty much in the same boat. They're the self-murdered. And then they encourage you to self-murder yourself, and then you do it. And then any anxiety that exists today is not, uh, Greg, the anxiety of, oh my God, I wish we were all free. I just wish we could get rid of Big Brother. and I'm losing sleep because we're in a slaveocracy. No, the stress is, I, gee, I wish I could get a better placement in that slaveocracy. Gee, my biggest problem is I wish I could really get rid of my selfhood completely. I wish it wouldn't bother me at all. And I was able to go along and get along and be a real celebrity, you know, and have everything that Big Brother could hand me. I, I haven't got enough seniority within the lie. Right. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. And that's why that answers, as I said, if people think about this, it'll answer a lot of things. One thing it answers is why so many people in so many parts of the world deny the conspiracy and fall in line, you see, that's why there's so many treacherous, deceptive people all over the world in the state of delusion, so that when somebody like me starts to speak, they go, Michael, you're crazy. Look at all, look at all the same people uh, with their uniforms on, walking in lockstep. What are you telling us, that we're crazy? You see, that's why it's so ubiquitous throughout the world, because it's an inner psychological um, contract that people have with themselves. And so you have to free yourself, first of all, from that web of lies. You have, to, you have to ask yourself, not that I've been sold a lie, but why have I bought a lie? Hell yeah. I mean, I find that all the time. The further, the more I talk about this type of material, be it even, even the control side of it, or even the, even the Nephilim side of it, even the Anunnaki side of, of all that ancient stuff, or be it Atlantis, or UFOs, or anything, I'm constantly seeing myself marginalized by people yeah. I've known for 15 years that just yeah. they they don't have an interest and I'm like I just can't I'm, I can't see how there's no how they don't have an interest it's kind of it's it's fun. it's like they they'd rather continue to play the game and get try to get ahead in it like you said than admit they're playing the game at all and yeah uh, but if you 
But if you brought your 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 balls to do a juggling act in front of them, you'd have tons of mates. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> How do we get back to finding our selfhood, if you, as you said? By never asking anybody else how to do it. And by fully, uh, by, by disconnecting that chain. You know, and first of all, just noticing it, simply without judgment. Because the more, if you judge yourself, then you're doing the same self-sadism and beating yourself up. Just observe it, like any uh, genealogist observes whatever he observes. You know, it's, it's basically a sort of a rational observation of the self. And how we disempower ourselves. My work is entirely based on that. It's a deconstructive process. Or I've also described it in other ways, an uh, um, apophatic uh, learning, in which you simply deconstruct and try to break down uh, the kind of uh, barriers that stand in the way of your selfhood. Ultimately, all thinking is destructive. Uh, I know people have a very difficult time understanding this, but thinking is deconstructive. The rational, critical apparatus is to break down illusion, to see through lies. Scientists do it every day. Detectives do it every day. We do it every day. Progress is all about looking at how to do a thing better which means throwing out all redundant ways of doing things. That's what psychoanalysis, psychology, philosophy is all about. And one of those threads is the simple, uh, natural response that we have to seek guidance from the misguided. Uh, there's many reasons why we do it, but it needs to stop. And we have an entire world full of gurus and teachers and pseudo-teachers and misleaders and whatever else, uh, who, because they have a little modicum of, of knowledge or insight, you know, technical or other, they then set themselves up as gods. This was pointed out even by Socrates, you know, 300 years B.C., that this is what people do. And then they set themselves up as authorities and then try to dominate everybody else. They don't awaken your own natural intelligence. Shit, that, that threatens the hell out of them. They don't want that. So we have all these petty dictatorships, starting from the home, starting from the family level on, on up. And we have to watch that tendency in ourselves, and we have to realize that when it comes specifically to your question, how do we return to selfhood, there is no A to Z anywhere. There may be some signposts that other teachers and philosophers who've done lots of thinking through the centuries, and we definitely should be up to speed on a lot of their theories, of course, because we don't have one of the other paradoxes here is that the normal human life isn't long enough to even come to grips with some of this uh, information. That, that, unfortunately, is just a built-in problem. One of the things that assists us is the fact that we have, you know, many teachers, many philosophers and great men who have done a lot of this thinking for us and have sort of... Um, percolated down a lot of the key answers, and we should be up to speed with what they're talking about, but only as signposts. Uh, we still have to walk the map. We can't just get in line behind those guys. They knew what they knew for themselves. Their philosophies was an outcome of their particular psychology as well. It doesn't mean that it's going to fit everything that you know each other individual uh, understands. So you have to have all these teachings percolate down through your own consciousness, and that means work. That means hard work. And that means cutting no corners, but it doesn't seem like hard work if you're passionate about it. That's what is really separates the sheep from the goats. It's only a lot of hard work if a person is so distracted with other nonsense in the sensational world uh, and it hasn't got the passion. If the person has a passion about it, then it doesn't seem like hard work at all to familiarize yourself with these concepts. Um, you know, for instance, just explaining why there's this, the mind-body, you know, dualism or whatever it might be, or, or again, starting with the symbolism question, or asking the big question, is there a God, you know, and, and so forth and so on. If a man is passionate about these kinds of questions, then he will be guided, but he doesn't need any external physical guide necessarily. Those are just signposts that he meets on the way as he is doing the walking. This is, a, you know, a, the thing to bear in mind. Yeah, I mean, I know you're familiar with Alan Watts, but he basically taught me that Zen is just trying to act without that thinking filter. Just act immediately without overthinking it. And when it comes to the symbolism, that is where I think I just drive myself crazy. And, uh, like, for example, I have a friend, uh, Kyle, who swears, uh, by the symbology as well as, like, the 1111 phenomenon. And for me, it's just a hard thing to believe, but and I actually have been talking to him about, I've personally experienced an overwhelmingly amount of coincidences with the number 42, and uh, I don't understand why or what it could mean, and I drive myself crazy with interpreting some of the symbolism in life, because people, you know, uh, lectures talk about the idea that your higher self is trying to talk to you or lead you, or something's trying to lead you, and I drive myself crazy uh, wondering about the interpretation of symbols, or is there meaning in this, or am I just projecting this meaning onto something, and stuff like that. Like, how can we hone in on what's meaningful 
Well, you, we do it all the time, but what we do is, like you've just said in your sentence, you beat yourself up for doing it. That natural flow of intelligence that is projecting, and that's a good thing, you're meant to do that. You're meant to see all meaning, when you, even you speak about meaning, uh, there is no meaning external to you at all. All there is is existing things. That's where you start. The universe has a bunch of things in it, be it stars or trees or table legs or, you know, God knows what, or even for that, for that matter, other people. Those are what are known as objects of consciousness, right? And they just exist. But they don't actually have any meaning. This is the mistake that we have, we, we have uh, again, so we've flipped it over. We have an inverse understanding. Mm -hmm. Meaning comes only from within. So the person who's able to give meaning to life from within himself, he's living. He's what's known as actualized. He's an actual person. He actually has not only existence, which is given. See, we, did, we didn't create our own minds or our bodies, and we didn't create the universe. So in philosophy, for instance, they ask, what can you be certain of? Well, you can be certain of one thing. You didn't create yourself. And you didn't create the universe around you. That's certain, period. So start with that. And if you didn't, if you didn't create those things, then you sit and worrying about what existed before God existed and what, how the universe came in before the Big Bang and what might have been before time is kind of, in a way, really meaningless from an existential point of view because you weren't there. You didn't create it. And in your one life, you probably could never work it out. And even if you did work it out, say some scientists actually cracks this, which they haven't, would it really change the person's existential existence? The answer is no, it wouldn't. Next thing is you didn't uh, create life on this planet. Let's take it down from the universal right now to this, just this planet. Life on this planet, what is it, 15 million years old or whatever it is? Uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but we weren't there at the beginning of time when they say that human life or animal life or intelligent life began, right? So we weren't there at that origin, that point of origin either. So a lot of worrying about that period of time and what existed before it and how it happened and all that is really, again, useless, meaningless information uh, from a psychological and existential point of view. The only beginning, the only origin, the only miracle that we were privy to is the fact that we ourselves individually were born and that by being born, we, we grew a thing called consciousness. We we're able to think about ourselves. We we're able to think about thought. And we we're able to have this uh, incredible uh, facility. That origin we are in charge of. That, that origin we can study with this interior um, speculative you know, ability, this rational ability. So that is where then many philosophers have said the main focus should be. These other, these other things are of interest, of course, naturally, but they're not, they're not really of interest psychologically or existentially. Your existence, the fact that you came in with consciousness, and it's what you do with that consciousness, right, how you orient it. So thinking of itself is, again, meaningless. It's what you're thinking about, and it's how your thinking is uh, focused. This is where the real answers will come from. In other words, what I'm saying, again, is that meaning comes from within. You give your life meaning. But what we do is we shut off that organic intelligence, or it is shut off for us, again, by the parents and what have you. And then we, we start to conform, or we start to let other people lead, or, or they, we want other people to inspire us. We're really exhausted when it comes to turning the inner senses on. Because, again, that will, again, lead us onto our own path. You know, that, that breaks us away from the collective. That's why we're scared of it. We have, we, we're so traumatized that we lean. And what we lean on is the mob. The, we lean on the collective. Many people have even said that our so-called ego is just not the I at all. That, that is just a construct of the collective. Like the inner, the inner sense that you're talking about, do you believe that you can achieve like turning that back on through hallucin hallucinogenic drugs such as like ayahuasca or psilocybic mushrooms? Um, I can't say because again, I would, that would, my statement would be presumptive on every individual's particular uh, journey. Some people can. Um, Some people can. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, goodness me, a man in a dungeon could do it. Uh, when that when that when that will opens up within himself, so absolutely, I can't sit there and make a pronouncement one way or the other. Uh, or, or, because remember, you're talking about the individual psychology. If a person with a toxic uh, psyche, and who's basically self-murdered himself, goes and does one of these experiences, he may blow his brains out. He may blow his mind completely. Whereas another person who has a more healthy attitude, all of this breaks down to attitude, may go and have one of the most powerful experiences of life. Isn't it true that even David Icke started his uh, sort of journey, or if not started his journey, went on to have these powerful experiences? So again, you know, it's, it's really impossible for another person to uh, dictate or to speak about it, you know? Right on. Yeah. One way or the other. Yeah. What do you think life would look like today? What do you think uh, our lives would look like today if we hadn't been lied to or manipulated and this control hierarchy hadn't, uh, you know, hijacked 
the way we all live. Um, I thought a lot about that, of course, and um, I think that also the philosopher Nietzsche and to a certain degree Heidegger were very much uh, looking into that question. And, of course, they came up with it. The one thing that would have to be removed would be this incredible dependence on the mob, on the collective. They were both critiques, critics of the collective consciousness because they said that the collective energy, and they're not really the only ones. Uh, Sigmund Freud and Jung and others have said this in their own language. But Freud, I mean, it was uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger were the deepest, I think, and who sort of put language to this. And they basically were trying to say that, look, your ego or that part of you that they call I, they didn't use psychological language so in fact Heidegger didn't even use the word consciousness at all because he didn't believe we were thinking at all he said we still have to learn how to think but to in very brief summary I think what they were saying is that because our sense of selfhood is an inauthentic selfhood it's a pseudo self made up of just the approval rating you know this collective uh, collectivism uh, for instance let me give you an example I can't remember who it was but there was a famous uh, scientist or some sort of psychologist who, who basically said uh, that a child even learns that it is a separate entity from the simple act of it being looked at by a parent or by other people. When the child grows up, it has no sense in the early stages that it's an individual. It learns about that it is a self because it sees other people looking at it. And then it learns to look at other people in the same way. See, by being looked at, just the act of perception tells the child slowly, I am something that I must be being looked at. And then that develops slowly onto self-looking, like the subjective idea of being able to observe yourself. So in other words, the child wouldn't even have a subjective self, wouldn't even have a clue of its own existence without other people. The point being that you, there's a healthy need for collectivity. right? It's in the cues and affectations and exchange of body language and words and eye contact that even gives any one of us the feeling of selfhood. So... Uh, what they're trying to say is if you didn't have other people, you wouldn't even have a self, and we couldn't even possibly conceive what that would be like. But then, of course, you can go too far, because the roots of your sense of self is other people and their existence. It becomes very easy, as we've already been dialoguing in, this, in, this, in your program here, it's only one step away before that becomes extremely chronic, isn't it? It's only, because since people are the basis of our sense of self, my God, it's only the next step then to becoming completely absorbed in the collective for a sense of self. We may become even addicted to it. So then trying to go cold turkey and come off of that is a very elaborate and difficult process. And if anybody wanted to do it or try it, you know, again, it's not for me to say what would happen. Some people may be so traumatized by that. Say even if you tried some physical thing like removing yourself from people for two weeks or whatever, uh, or even for extended periods of time. History is full of people who actually became hermits and all and completely distanced themselves. You know, again, I can't make any pro or negative statement, you know, right. about whether that's a good thing or whatever. It depends on the personality of the individual, you know. So, if, but say somebody did this just purely experimentally. You know, maybe they'd have a complete breakdown and there'd be no self there at all. They'd be just crawling around the floor like some sort of animal. But then, of course, even animals have a sense of self. They, they obviously do. Um, and so, um, moving, moving on to say that, then, okay, say you don't, and you try to do it gradually to decipher, in, say, say you stay within society and try to gradually dis determine what is unique about yourself and what makes you the same as everybody else. Way back in my early first talks, even I addressed this. We know so much about what makes us the same as everybody else. I've said we have very little understanding of what makes us, uh, you know, unique. For instance, Michael. How many, how many, how many guys are called Michael in the world? You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, so it's like, what, what is unique about us? The clothes we wear, the names we have, the food we eat, the ideas in our head, the language we use. We we're speaking English or whatever. So you know, everything is shared. What actually then makes us unique? And is there anything at all? I mean, you're talking about the top philosophers in the world at the, the top of the totem pole haven't got an answer to that. They're still working on it to find out, is there anything that is actually really, truly unique about a person? Now, Heidegger and Nietzsche were, of course, implying that, yeah, there was. You know, there is something that is uh, authentic, unique about an individual, and their systems are there to try and show us how to attain that, you know. And uh, I guess that would also be somewhat what a lot of other famous teachers are trying to allude to. And then you have to know about those systems and, and come, to come to your own conclusions about which one of these systems 
that they're talking about, which one of these means to the end, is a, is a means to an end. That, that becomes a fascinating area of study. You know? So I, my personal belief is that absolutely. I don't think we were born by accident. I think that all of these things that keep us away from a sense of selfhood can be removed. But it's not so much that they can be removed, it's the way that they're removed. If you remove it in the wrong, it's like, you know, remember that the six million dollar man, you know, Steve Austin? Yeah. If you kind of dismantle this bomb and he does it the wrong way, the whole, lot, the whole country's going to blow up. So it's more like, it's like that. It's like the sweat is pouring down your face because it's not about that can you remove it. It's that if you jiggle or you do it wrong the wrong way, it's going to blow up in your face. So the philosophical process, you know, I mean, okay, you have one guy with a, like Alexander coming with a, a freaking sword to cut through the Gordian knot. You know, maybe that's not quite the right way. That's the way for him, but it may not be the same way for everybody else. To approach consciousness the wrong way can make you insane. Somebody would argue that that's what happened to Pernicia, you know, and, uh, and many other people that you could name. The lunatic asylums are filled with people who've actually seen the light. They know a hell of a lot, but they couldn't handle what they saw. So, Again, it's the mean, it's the way in which a lot of things are done is far more important than the what is being done. And uh, that again, you can't really train somebody for. You, you, you can't, you can show a certain, you can show a person how to use, like I say, a bow and arrow, right? But you can't change their perception. I mean, if they're half blind, there's nothing you can do, even if they, if you show them exactly how to put the string on the bow and put the arrow right and pull it back right and even stand right. But if they're blind and their, their eyesight is hopeless, you know, there's no chance of them getting to hit that target. So uh, you can show somebody a certain amount, 50%, but they have to bring their own unique skills and perception and, and ac acuity and brilliance to it. And then you have the miracle of life. So, again, pointing out forever, like you said, Alan Watts, you know, there's been a whole history of great teachers who have shown us what to do. You know, Krishna Murti and you, na you name it. Or, like I said, these Nietzsche's and Heidegger's and all, you know, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to go and do it. It's, it's, you, they have to say, hey, you know, this is what I've discovered. And then you've got to say, yeah, well, let me try and do the experiment as well and see what comes with this. So I do believe that these dependencies are bad. I do believe that there's a, people have a pathology that can be healed and can be removed. But again, it's all about how you do it. What's your intention as to why you're doing it? As you know, a lot of people will want enlightenment for the wrong reasons. They may want it to have more power over people or whatever, or they may want to sit at the right hand of God or whatever it might be. So the reasons, the motives, you know, uh, may, may be the thing that they want might look good on paper. But do we really know the reasons why they want to do it? You know, what's the motive behind it? Could be really, really negative. We're all motivated, motivated by something. Yeah. There's good motivations and bad motivations, you know. I mean, I've always had a problem with, you know, why would you want to be a guru? Why would you want to be a Sai Baba? Even if you have seen the light. You mean to tell me that you've gone and seen the light and then you want, you're happy, the fact, with a bunch of completely clueless, auto-hypnotized millions sitting in front of you on their knees looking up to you like, God, i got a problem with that right away. But then I see a lot of other people don't. They think that's wonderful that he's there making all these miracles and enlightening everyone, you know. So it's, again, there's, too, there's so many schools of thought. I can look at somebody and think that's a charlatan. That's a person that, you know, even if he has the light, why would he be using it this way? But another person might come along and go, no, it's a wonderful thing, you know, all these repressed uh, Americans and all, they can sit there and, you know, this is wonderful. This is really going to help them become enlightened, you know. You get more enlightenment out of watching Star Trek than sitting at some Indian guru's feet. I don't know. So it's all perception. It's all an individual's take on it. Some people want to escape themselves so much that they'll seek for the first, you know, guy uh, waving an incense stick and dressed in orange to sell their soul to. You know, there's millions of ways to escape. Million, working in a job from nine to five, looking for that success, you know. Um, tyranny, you may not put a gun to somebody's head and dress in military you know, gear with a bunch of medals on your chest. You may want to be the next, po uh, you know, uh, Nobel Prize winner or something like that. That's another, will, that's another power trip, you see. So it can be done under the pretext of uh, doing charity or humanity for people. In psychology and philosophy, you're always looking to motives. You're not so fooled by the outward show of things, which so many people in our world today are completely um, bamboozled by, you know, the outward show. They've got to think about the motives, the psychological motives. So the optimistic aspect of this does connect with the trauma period that you were alluding to earlier, because if you look at the chronology of that trauma, and again, I'm saying you don't even have to believe it had anything to do with the Nephilim, even if you just accept it was, bio, it was uh, physical or whatever, planetary, whatever, it's such a short time ago that the optimistic attitude when you study this uh, matrix of power and control is that, look, we may be actually healing from it. 
And you just can't force that healing and any more than you can tell a guy who's been through a car wreck, you know, and, and broken a couple of legs, you know, to get up and walk right away. So this trauma that happened, happened to all the human race, we're in a healing cycle. And so it's kind of really not too clever or rational to be utterly pessimistic because these things do take time. And they, and what I mean is centuries. So even though we maybe still see so much darkness and so much tyranny and so much control and we lament it and it's good to lament it, you're not meant to be happy about corruption. At the same time, it may be that the ego is gradually, imperceptibly healing in its own unique way. And that what is true and what is rich and what is real inside us never dies, can never perish. This was with the core of Nietzsche's teachings that no matter how dark things get, he referred to it as the will to power. That will can never, ever die. It's eternal. So no matter how black things get and how oppressive things get, there will be no crushing of that light. So even if you're not a religious man, you know, you're just coming out of a more uh, human, sort of a humanistic school, even in that humanistic school, they claim that the spirit of man can't be crushed down forever and it will come back and always will. There's always, there's always a compensatory action in life and one might say that the awakening that you're seeing today amongst ordinary people is part of that awakening. That people, the lie just cannot persist forever and that the people will find some instinctual or some very deeply um, a seed of wholeness within them that they will want to actualize. You know, one can argue that that is also the case. Right. I've heard many people refer to this time as the age of enlightenment, age of awakening. Uh, yeah. In, an, in astrological terms, which well, I get, I really have a hard time with the astrology part and, and really seeing how that could affect us, but it is funny to see that the internet came directly at the time that's considered a time of enlightenment, and if I were to write that thousands of years ago on paper, the internet would be the perfect incarnation of, of that coming to life, so I do see a similarity there and a coincidence. Well, are you familiar with my theories on the inner zodiac? The inner zodiac. I don't think I've heard the inner zodiac theories. Yeah, yeah, that, because I agree with you that uh, if you look at the astrology from the wrong end of the binoculars, it doesn't make a bit of sense at all, and you're into something completely false. The origins of the zodiac are internal. The, the so-called external zodiac that people are studying um, is nothing more than a projection of consciousness. And I have that information on my um, Tarascope's website. There's articles and interviews and, and uh, a video tour that I made that will explain the origins of the zodiac connecting to consciousness. In other words, the very same mecha um, the very same architecture of your consciousness, the very ability that you even have to know the difference between one, two, three, four, you know, even the numbers one to ten, how you can tell that they have an order, that they run in this order, or that the one is different from seven. That same ability to, to learn language, you know, like Noam Chomsky speaking about the incredible innate architecture of linguistics that a child has that enables that child to then go on and learn any language, whether it's any foreign language or English or Italian. How is it that children can do this when these linguistic skills are unbelievably complex? No computer could do it. He talks about that there are these innate, inbuilt categories of linguistics in the mind. So in exactly the same way as he's expressed that, those, uh, that architecture, that mental architecture, so the principles of the zodiac, the mathematical underlying architecture, you know, the seven, the twelve, the three and the four and so on, that is in our psyche. And it's only because of the incredible misrepresentation of astrology by these so-called astrologers who haven't the faintest idea about the origins of their own uh, subject matter. And it's also because of the egregious, um, uh, you know, backlashing or whatever you want to call it, um, criticism from this, this sort of materialist atheist crony, you know, crowd who want to deny that there's any spiritual dimension to, to humankind. You know, astrology as a pure science has, has really been, has suffered a lot. But when you understand that it is based on a projection of human consciousness, then you'll start to understand more about what goes on. The zodiac, whether you're talking about the great ages, you know, the, the more the processional ages, or you're talking about the, the yearly zodiac, these are just simply projections of human consciousness. So, so I always encourage my audience to, you know, go and study up on that so they get more clear on when I even myself make, you know, slip and talk about Uranus or Pluto or Venus or Sun. I always try to, you know, 
caveat that by saying that, look, I don't actually mean some planet in space necessarily. I'm speaking about an archetypal yeah. force. Yeah. yeah, like a more of a, a spiritual, uh, sort of a, a psycho uh, physical force. It's just, a, it's just a means of communication like music. The, the zodiac works on very similar principles as, as the way that musical notes communicate to us, you know. I mean, there's a reason why people like to listen to Stairway to Heaven or a piece of Chopin, you know. That stuff is, is, is speaking to us. Well, the zodiac, the zodiacal archetypes, um, any symbolism, in fact, whether it's alchemical, mathematical, color, for instance, the, mystery, the, the miracle of color, we could have five shows on just that. You know, so we're being spoken to all the time. Remember you were speaking earlier about you and the number 42 and, and how you were playing with that and wondering what the significance is. You see, that number, it's not the number that's the problem really there. It's what that number symbolizes in many ways. Uh, the factors that make it up, uh, the relationship between this number four and the number two. Because there's really two numbers there, right? You said 42, but that actually implies two numbers there, four and two. And those numbers got a lot of different spiritual, esoteric relationships. But to cut it short, what I mean is that numbers, be it 1 to 10, they are themselves meaningless. Like I said, those are just things that exist. What, what exists behind them is frequency, energy. And those are archetypes. So the numbers are really messengers of a certain vibration. They're, they're conveying a certain vibration. For instance, the number 4 basically conveys the vibration of order, structure, and uh, practicality, you know? So each number represents a particular frequency. And um, that can be universalized, like in normal, most numerology, we'd say those numbers go for everybody, and that's fine and dandy, but ultimately, each individual has a personal relationship with those numbers as well. When, when one would get into it and study it and come to their own relationship, you know, some people, for instance, I'll give you one example of the number four, mandalas. When Carl Jung famously had these clients who went through, well, it wasn't even really major breakthroughs. It was almost like just the first stage of the breakthroughs that they had. Something led them to express themselves by painting mandalas. As you know, mandalas are made of four, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are the square symbolism. And, um, and so what is that? Well, Nietzsche would have come along and said, well, I'll tell you what that is. That is a man's aesthetic response because man is primarily an aesthetic creature long before he uses his reason long before he even becomes aware that there's a mathematical order to the universe um, long before any of that any of that left brain stuff every man including every child is turned on initially by the simple beauty of what's around him and in fact Nietzsche took this to the extent anyone who wants to know Nietzsche has to understand that the aesthetic appreciation and aesthetic creations like music and art, actually going and doing it, writing poetry. This was the center of his philosophy, and many others have swore by this as well, that they claim that the whole meaning of life is, is based on this aesthetic appreciation. But without even getting into any of that, just the very fact that nature was so intoxicatingly beautiful to look at, even thunderstorms or lightning or the sunrise or whatever it might be, the, the miracle of the flow of river, you know, a river and whatever, this mm -hmm. made man wonder, wow, how did this all come into being? And so, they saw that man's original uh, state of consciousness was just this completely spontaneous response to beauty, right? And we still have it today. Um, and in fact, I, I mean, we know this because you can look down through all of history and all the people that we admire, including the Leonardo da Vinci's, were artists before they were geometrists or scientists. They were the greatest minds in the world were often scientifically inclined, but they were also extremely artistic. I mean, half the buildings we live in, half the state buildings of the world, based on that Romanesque design, for instance, were designed not just by people who had brilliant mathematical skills, and geometric skills, but were also incredibly inspired artistically, like Vitruvius and Paco, uh, Pacioli and all of these other guys you see. Same thing in music. So, yeah, music is mathematical to the extent that you've got to know the notes and you've got to know the, you know, writing, the writing aspect of music. But long before that, and even at the end of it, it's more about the beautiful aspect of it. You see, so half the stuff that we do in the world or more of, of, of it is motivated by this aesthetic sense. And therefore, that's important as well to, to bear in mind that we have this innately within ourselves. And when you're responding then to those numbers, those numbers just represent, uh, in geom geometrical form, they may represent some sort of geometry. 
or they may represent some sort of um, Archimedean geometry, you know, like the platonic solids and what have you. A lot of people, when they see numbers like 333 and 777 and 888 and 222, there's a lot of triad numbers appear for people. I think you mentioned even yourself earlier on 1111. Yeah. Was that you that mentioned that? It, yeah. it is. It's a, a friend of mine. He's, he's convinced that the coincidence of 1111, seeing it in, uh, not only in his, he sees like a double L in his last name and the last name of his girlfriend, and he sees symbolism in that being 1111. Understood. Uh, in addresses and times that things happen when he's thinking of certain things and mile markers on driving on the highway. Well, this is a language that when you're coming to it from this left brain point of view, it, 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 it seems very strange. And a lot of people can think you're kind of crazy. But what's actually happening is that slowly, the natural intelligence that we've been alluding to before, or if you want to say right brain or this aesthetic sense or whatever it might be, that's awakening. And we don't, we don't, we stop it. We get freaked out by it and we, we, we uh, stop doing it. Uh, and therefore, like right now on the clock as I'm looking, where I'm in Europe, it says 314. That's pi. Yeah. So now, how significant is pi? It's so significant. We just happen now to be talking about uh, sacred geometry and numerology and the mystical aspects of of, of a number. And I'm looking at the clock, and it's three fourteen exactly. That's the left brain goes. The left brain goes. Complete coincidence has no meaning. But who's to say to me it has no meaning? I decide whether it has meaning or not. You see, as we said earlier, it connects to that thing about bringing meaning out from yourself. So this not organic flow, yeah. So these numbers now. Now say your friend went and started to discover about the platonic solids, the dodecahedron, the octa, the cube octahedron, the uh, tetrahedron, right? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. happened to be based on the cellular structure of the body, you know. And there's so many other authors who've gone into this far more deeply than I've done. People like John Veloma Chizadek and even Greg Braden to a certain extent. There's many books out on this subject. You will start to find that the dimensions of these. Uh, we, uh, these are platonic solids. There's five platonic solids and 18 Archimedean solids. And those, by the way, are in the universe. Those, that's, those, those just embody the very essence of the architecture of the universe, right? You will start to discover that these very numbers that you keep noticing or some part of your br brain is attracted to turn out to be the numbers that are the numbers of these vertices and the numbers of the, the sides and the, the dimensions of these particular objects these solids, or even the body human itself, the human body's dimensions itself from a Pythagorean Fibonacci point of view. And you have the Fibonacci series, you've got many other spiritual esoteric series that are inherent in the natural order. There's the ones that you know about, and then there's the ones they don't want you to know about. So there's only these uh, spiritual uh, n numerology that's encoded into the Sphinx, that's encoded into the pyramid, uh, that's encoded into the human body, and so forth and so on. There's so many... Uh, uh, you know, uh, books I could uh, refer to people who are, if they're fascinated by this, I've gone into it a great length in my own work. And so these dimensions are those living archetypes. But the thing that those numbers are, are the bridge between you, right, your microcosmic understanding, your microcosmic intelligence, and the external, apparently external macrocosmic world. You're related to that. The world is made out of the same stuff as your consciousness is made out of. It's um, completely uh, psychophysical, psychosomatic. And therefore, those numbers, in one sense, are the language of the exchange of the energy between your psyche and the physical world. And we have moved only from a left brain point of view, where the only numbers we care about are the numbers of you know, money. And, and we, we've reduced it down to such a boring, banal level, of one, two, three, four, you know, like they're dead things. You know, it no longer has an esoteric or spiritual component to it. Yet in ancient days, which we record in our minds, right, our consciousness is the culmination of millennia of experience. Well, that ancient ancestral voice, you know, it knows what the number 2 or the number 3 or the number 22, you know, number 44, whatever, represents. And we've shut that off, unfortunately. So it's very, very important in spiritual development to reopen it again. Right. How do you, how do you suggest we do that really how do we open that back up studying sacred geometry studying numerology um you know I've, my mystery school the time gnosis we have people working with these numbers on a very practical level so that that hopefully will be the starting ground for them to then go on to use double digit numbers and so on and so forth and getting into the tarot all of the tarot cards have numbers and they have deeply esoteric meanings 
all the divination arts. That's extremely important to get involved with that if you're inter interested in what you're asking. Sacred geometry is part of it as well. And uh, I would say even studying these solids, like I spoke about, the geometrical solids, the Archimedean, 18 Archimedean uh, forms, and the five platonic solids, and their dimensions, and their vertices, and the relationships between each other, like how many planes do they have, how many uh, vertices do they have. This is what fascinated the ancients who built the pyramid. Half the ziggurats and pyramids are based on very precise geometry of 618, that's the phi ratio, and what have you, and many other numbers I could mention, you see. Um, the number 66 appears a lot. The Bible is loaded with it. Uh, do you think the, uh, speaking of the pyramid, do you think the pyramids were built by, does your research show, have you found that the pyramids are built by human ancients alone? Um, I don't know. I think that uh, I'm not even sure they're dated right, and I can tell you right. that. That's a Graham Hancock uh, thing. Yeah. Is he thinks uh, they're way older. Yeah, I've, I've always maintained that. I think they were built way back in the processional age of Virgo, if not even before that. But um, who, as to who built them, I think uh, enlightened humans, you know, this Atlantean knowledge. Because remember, it's not only in Egypt that you have these precisely designed. They're everywhere. They're everywhere, they're including in Ireland as well. What, what did you say? Some are even under the ocean. Yes, the ones that Hancock has photographed, exactly so. There's no doubt in my mind that there was a gigantic school of knowledge. That's why people I refer to as the Arya or the, the Druids or whatever. These were a worldwide organization, and uh, they're known in Egypt as the Shamsu Hor, or Disciples of Horus. And they're the ones who actually built the pyramid, but the knowledge that uh, they brought with them was Atlantean. It was from the ancient days when uh, lots more things were known about the planet Earth than we can ever imagine. And the, also the consciousness of people was pre-trauma. So we're talking about people who had a very high level of consciousness here and uh, knew how to move these blocks. You know, now there's even some, in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been some individuals who've even learned to move these stones. But 20 years ago, there wasn't even a crane that could have lifted them. Now they've made some small effort to even show that they could have been physically maneuvered, you know, so we're slowly, slowly making progress to realize that, yeah, it probably could have been done just with what we would describe as human beings, you know, without necessarily believing any supernatural uh, or, or off-world presence. But again, I'm open to all things because those sarcophagi, and I don't just mean the ones in uh, the pyramid, but the ones in Saqqara in the south, it, I mean, the top engineers in the world with the latest equipment, the latest measuring equipment, cannot work out to this day how the angles of the inside of these boxes, you know, like the king's copper, yeah. and these other big, yeah. big, giant, uh, what they call sarcophagi, it's just nobody can work out how those angles are so precise. They don't even have the tools to do it today, let alone to cut them and get them so precise. And then the utter travesty, when they come to date it, they, they pick up a piece of broken pottery from beside it, Date that pottery, right? There could be yeah. some, you know, piss pot that some guy put there, some old shepherd. Date that and then say, oh, well, now we know how old the sarcophagus was. I mean, that now passes for academic, you know, sort of like, you know, science or whatever. Yeah, this is what they hand to you on the plate for hundreds of years. Wow. Now, as far as the this this knowledge of the planet that is obviously on a mass scale lost right now, do you think that the elite still hold this knowledge true because it seems like throughout history there's been a pattern of conquering a group, burning all the records, destroying everything they have, building a school. Well, two things about that is I don't believe the records were destroyed. All these libraries, I believe, were sequestered first. Um, the ancient libraries, they say that Alexandria Library was burned down like, you know, about uh, four times or something. Mm -hmm. But there's some very severe controversy about the final burning when Caesar was there. And in my eyes, it was the knowledge was taken just in exactly the same way that history tells us that the Temple of Jerusalem, so-called, was plundered by Titus and all the gear was taken over to Rome. So there's no question about it that these uh, dragon court, whether they be the Roman version or the Greek version or whatever, these people were plunderers. They knew where they were going. They knew about the antiquity and they even knew about the sacredness of the, of the stuff they were getting their hands on. So number one, I don't believe that it was burned. I believe it was sequestered. And that that has been, they've had access to that through their private libraries. We all know about the famous Vatican Library, but that's only one of many, many, many private libraries all over the world that nobody would have a chance to get into, not even on a very high level, not even if you were a very senior 
uh, academic. There's libraries that they just simply would not let you have access to unless you're an extremely high level Freemason or you know member of the Illuminati or what have you. Uh, now and again, something leaks out here and there, but ultimately, you know, uh, th that'll only all that'll leak out is that, that yeah, that these things exist. What's in them never gets sort of revealed or what have you. Yeah, it's and funny then, that after thousands, of, like thousands of years, no ruling member of the elite has ever just come forward with a smoking gun just out of guilt. <laughs> um, because they have a lot to lose. Remember, it's a simple mafioso situation in which, first of all, most of them are ideologically completely in agreement with what's taking place. Secondly, they've got a lot to lose because once you go through their system, and I mean even just in a more sort of a humdrum, you know, you went to their colleges, you joined their fraternities, you sort of, you did well, and then you moved on and they put you in a nice position, you were the head of this or you were the head of that, you know, they, they give you a bank to run or a country to run and all this kind of thing. You know, or a big shipping line or whatever. You know, you don't really have, you know, the power to sort of turn back. I mean, one of the things you got to understand about these guys is they sacrifice a hell of a lot to take that silver spoon. I mean, you know, that has to be understood. There's really no way out. I mean, the, the, there's a movie called Brotherhood of the Bell that sort of lays this on the line and shows you how difficult it is. You know, because they'll ruin you. And if they don't ruin you first, they'll ruin your brother. His business will suddenly go bankrupt for some bizarre reason, you know, uh, or whatever. They will, they will mess with people around you to give you the warning. And most of the highest level guys don't even need the warning because it's already inbuilt into their brain that if you ever think that you're going to, you know, bite the hand that feeds you here, think again. Because they'll make you very aware of the fact that others have tried it and lost. So this minimizes it. It doesn't rule it out completely. Right. And it doesn't stop accidents from happening. For instance, during Perestroika, you know, lots of files were left just stupidly big buildings full of precious, precious files were left unguarded. And so independent journalists were able to go in and grab all of the stuff. Same thing happened in Franco's, Russia, uh, Franco's uh, during the, the Civil War in, in the, you know, the Nazi uh, or the fascist leader Franco in Spain. Uh, an incident, for instance, like will happen where the Allies came and bombed the whole of Barcelona and the bombs did strike the government buildings. And all the filing cabinets were like blown open, right? And all the soldiers and everybody in the guards had scattered, leaving some very important uh, journalists to run in and basically grab and hide all those precious, precious files and then spent their life translating it. And, and because of that, we have authors that we know now amazing things about, you know, the Jesuit connection to Franco, or we know something about the, the secret society Freemasonic connection that never would have come out any other way, you see. So there's flukes that happen. There was the occasional whistleblowing person, but it, yeah, it doesn't happen often, and it's it's uh, it happens enough, I think, to for people like myself and Yuri Lina and other people to go and you know gather that data. But certainly, yes, it's it's not as much as you'd want, no. What do you but coming back coming back to your original question, do they have the knowledge? Do they have, maintain that ancient knowledge? The answer is absolutely yes. We know that this is the case because the ley lines, the architecture. Uh, you only need to go back to the rise of the Templars in Britain. The Templars go a long way back, right back to the 9th century, 13th century, what have you. But even if you just deal with the, the 11th century of the, the original Templar families coming to England during the Battle of Hastings, the simple fact of their ability to position their houses, monasteries, and subsequently their uh, churches and their state buildings, on key areas of the geomantic grid right. is just could not be coincidence. Well, Washington and, is set up that way. If I'm yes, thinking. exactly. Yeah. Same thing again over in America in that, in that situation. You find that just so much precision. And when you really get into it and you find out how much they observed uh, the movement of certain planets, individual planets, particularly uh, uh, Jupiter, but then stars like the movement of the star Sirius, for instance, the meticulous uh, observation of any of this is obviously not dreamt up in five minutes. I mean, these things are very difficult. And remember, you have to sequester it because you can't even let ordinary, clever laymen know about it. Not all laymen are stupid. Some of them are very intelligent, but they're not in on the game. So you have to have these fraternities. You have to have these secret fraternities to make sure that this knowledge isn't even then misused by non, what they were called muggers in the street, right? That's highly intelligent laymen who shouldn't know this. And we don't want those laymen also going out and teaching everybody else how to do it either. So remember, occult knowledge is occult because they want to keep it for themselves. They don't want you doing it. Right. 
they don't want you finding out about it. And so they sh they've locked it down. That's why they, if, they, if you try and go and study anything that's more esoteric, well, you're not going to be able to. You have to pick that up on your own time. You're not going to be able to study it within college or university. In fact, you may put a, a, a you may put a target on your back by even mentioning that you're interested in these things. Do you think that the the symbolism that the elite use, obviously, I, I assume you'd think there's some esoteric energy in that symbolism. Do you think that's what allows them to maintain the sphere of control over many years and over a global network? Yeah. Because they, remember, the, the sciences that they're using, these meta arts that they're using, are not negative in themselves. There's nothing evil about the, No, there's nothing evil about compasses and protractors and, right, right, you right. know, uh, tarot cards and astro astrology. And any of the things that they're using in themselves are completely neutral. As a matter of fact, all the tools that they're using were once in the hands of, you know, the world's greatest enlightened people and were, were used for the good of all humanity. And more than that, the things that they're using, these sciences that they're using, are the sciences of the universe. They're the science, that's the science that holds the universe together. These alchemical principles and these sacred geometrical principles and these artistic, and musical and whatever else, color, how they manipulate color, how they manipulate light, those are all uh, rules, laws, or whatever you want to call it, that are already there in the universe. These people are skewers. They, they are able to reconfigure... Um, that which is natural. Evil is nothing more than the subversion, right, of what is natural. They didn't create a thing. In fact, they, they are, that's what sorcerer, that's the difference between magic and sorcerer. So when, you, when, for example, when you see this symbolism come out in corporate logos, do you yeah. think they use that uh, because it's just uh, appealing to our subconscious? I do. I think that's the reason, and that simply that they're putting their badge on it, just in the same way that uh, if you created something or you start a football team, you know, you, you you sit around a lot thinking about the logo and what it represents. You may base that logo on a hero of yours, or you what you may want to commemorate a famous figure. You see, so you think a lot about the reason why you create these uh, logos. They do the same thing if they're looking to commemorate uh, not only their line, the bloodline. Like, for instance, right now on the forum, under Empire of Death, I've got a logo from the City Guilds of London, you know, tying into the whole royal oligarchic control of London, and therefore meaning the rest of the world. One of their organizations that they control is a network of uh, guilds, network of universities called the Guilds, City Guilds. The symbol of that is a red lion, but the tail is a, a coiled serpent. I mean, anybody can go and look at it and agree with me that it looks like a blinking serpent, because it certainly doesn't look like a tail. Well, that is that that tail is is meant to indicate a serpent, because they're not really speaking about the lion; they're speaking about the dragon court. The the, um, the serpent is the serpent brotherhood, right? Uh -huh. So, in that instance, that logo is just simply commemorating the lion, not an individual, not a, not a potentate from the lion, just the lion itself, a red lion, you know, and that connects to if you go to astrology, well, the red lion is Aldebaran, right? A star known, known as Aldebaran in Leo and what have you, on and on and on. That's why so many Templar inns, bars, pubs are called red lion, because they know what we don't know. But then, um, more broadly, they may want to commemorate a specific figure. And therefore, the logo will now actually be uh, representing a person or some trait that they had, you know, or, or colors that they preferred, or something out of their own coat of arms. There's all sorts of ways of doing this, this arrangement. Uh, it ties into even why there, somebody came along, they wanted to identify Obama, his facial features, <coughs> and his presidency with Akhenaten. It's the same thing I'm telling you about. When you study this stuff, that's nothing remarkable there at all. To everyone else, it's remarkable. But as a matter of fact, that's the kind of symbol was part of Yeah, yeah, name. that's exactly, exactly, that's like... Do me a favor. In fact, if you, I've got it on the forum. If you take the symbol of his little round solar symbol with the three striations mm -hmm. and put it right next door to the Akhenaten symbol of the sun, and I've got it right there on the symbolism page in the forum. I mean, a complete imbecile can see that they're, the, that they're, they're a designer take on, on the same thing. So this is the, the, what they do habitually. This, it's just the way they do things. We may only notice it once in our entire lives and then go, wow, that's really weird. These guys are masters on it. I mean, you can't go to a state building 
you can go to Christian churches and find the green man. You know, you can, you can find the head of Mithras. You can find the head of Dionysus and all sorts of paganism symbolism on, on Christian churches, on civic buildings, checkered floors galore. How many people walk across the checkered floor when they walk into a uh, state building or even for that matter a university or a college? How many of those people, I'm just asking a simple question, it's nothing to do with anything conspiratorial. How many people actually know that the checkered floor refers to the Knights Templars and the Cistercian Order? Just simply that. No, right. very few. Not even the teachers who do it every day. So there you go. But yet they're in this university meant to be learning things, yeah. meant to be educated, and couldn't tell you why the dimensions of a portal, you know, are that way. Or, or, you know, there's people going around with the name Tyler or whatever. wouldn't even know where that word came from. It wouldn't even know what it means, that it's Masonic. You know, people going around calling, yeah, I'm called uh, Stephen Cohen. What's the word Cohen mean? Well, I, I, I don't know. You know, uh, so you have, you, it's right there in plain sight. We're not talk. in one way we say, people like me are always talking about this is esoteric and that's esoteric. In, in one way, that's not even really true. A lot of it's so obvious, you know what I mean, that it's really not esoteric. It's right there in plain view, so it's a combination. And you can literally go back and take these dollar bill symbols and the, the symbols of Texaco or the symbols of Shell Corporation or I don't know what, AT&T, you name it, and you can find the exact duplicates way back in the time of Rome, way back in the time of Egypt, if it hasn't already been suppressed. That's only what we've got. Right. And you you mentioned the Green Man, which uh, jarred a memory of mine. I, I saw a lot, like, obviously a lot of the symbolism happens in Hollywood as well. Yeah, but I've exactly. seen uh, thing on... Jim Carrey specifically embodying the green man in his movies like uh, The Mask, he wears a green mask, uh, he also played the Grinch, which is a green character, um, are a couple examples, and it just makes me wonder like, well, I wouldn't think that he, like is he in, in on that? Like it just seems weird that uh, you'd be able to find these coincidences and point out like 10, 12 different instances of symbolizing the green man for an, some actor. I don't know, like... Well well, just in the same way that you don't blame the merchant necessarily if his logo turns out to be some sort of Masonic thing. Right. You don't exonerate them either, but you don't necessarily implicate them until you're totally sure. Mm -hmm. You don't also implicate the actor necessarily if his, if his smart-ass uh, production people who are making these films are much smarter than him. Right. So you think that, you know, if he were to be symbolized in the Green Man, that it's more producers, people behind the scenes that find these scripts to put them in, and what, I just under, don't understand what the purpose is of creating uh, that type of situation. Well, that's because you have to study magic. You have to learn about sympathetic magic, these deep forms of hypnosis that are used. Uh, uh, I've always tried to put it this way. Uh, first, let me answer your question about the actor sure. dynamic. The art directors are the ones who do it all. The art directors work with the producers, work with, not the producer, but the directors, they often are coming from a deeply, uh, in, a great interest, sometimes healthy, sometimes not, interest in symbolism. Then you have a lot of these directors, because believe me, it's not easy to make movies. It, it takes millions. You have to be really in with the establishment. <coughs> so, for instance, a particular person like uh, Stanley Kubrick, for instance, right. their work is layered with esoteric meaning because either they have a, an interest in it as a layman or they are actually members of esoteric societies and are just front men for those Masonic societies. So when you go frame by frame and start looking at the esoteric symbolism in say something like uh, Eyes Wide Shut or even a Spielberg piece of garbage you know like uh, oh my god Back to the Future or whatever this nonsense you know yeah, and then you start encounters apparently had a lot of exactly. it in. and there's so many other even now these latest movies are immortal you know it's all this Nephilim symbolism and what have you so yeah when you go frame by frame you start noticing all this obviously esoteric stuff that's because these people are themselves just front men messengers so to speak mercurial messengers for these secret societies who want to put out this esoteric information but they have learned from a long time back to do it in this uh, play of masks okay now that doesn't mean that the guy who's trying to earn a living at the end, often they're completely ignorant. I mean, I've even tracked some of these uh, films when the when the actor is being interviewed about some of the symbolism. You know, I mean, they, they're totally idiotic. They don't have a clue. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. All I can say is that yeah, there's a humongous difference between the level of intelligence of a Peter Weir, who would make the Truman Show, uh -huh. and 
the actor, right, mm -hmm. who if you ask him later on after the movie's made, so what do you think that meant when you went through a door in the sky? Uh, well, gee, I don't really know, you know. Yeah, so I got paid. <laughs> exactly. Right? They're like performing seals. Later on, they may become a little bit more knowledgeable, and certainly if they want to go on and direct anything, they're going to have to start getting into it. And believe me, I'm the first to say that I'm skeptical about all of these people, actors included. I mean, I am really skeptical about them all. I do believe they're one big giant cabal there in Hollywood that a lot of these guys are in the know. I'm very unforgiving with them, but at the same time, one has to always say, take each individual case as it goes. But then getting on to the more deeper question of the esoteric stuff, is I, I sum it up like this. One of the most important things to always remember when you're dealing with the multimedia here, and especially the people who create video games and all of this, all of this media, visual media, is that we would be in a dire straight psychotic state if they weren't able to feed, drip feed us some of the archetypal symbolism that they've also raped us of by the other hand. In order to get the slave to be the slave, you had had to rape him through his life, through centuries of time, on, uh, on this archetypal level, you've got to put, you know, 50 foot steel doors between him and his true self, or you have to shut down the right brain. You know, there's many ways of languaging this. You have to shut down his aesthetic appreciation, like we talk about Nietzsche saying you have to open it up again. Uh, but what they have discovered to their horror is that if you do that, then you basically have a psychotic creature on your hands. Now, they don't mind that to a degree. But the psychotic has still got to get in this car every day and go down there and push the wheel. He's still got to breed a new generation of slaves and whatever else, you see, to run the entire planet. So they only want a certain neurotic individual so fucked up that he, he won't be able to do his inner homework to find his spiritual core. But he shouldn't be so crazed out, so lost, that he can't perform his duties for Big Brother. So what they do then is they send you down to the cinema or they put these because they know that the food of the mind must be symbolic you're missing this whole archive inside yourself that they have suppressed they've raped whole nations man whole i'm talking about the wholesale rape of entire groups of people not just the druids but many other powerful gnostic spiritual groups who used to teach people this who very much were using symbolism who were trying to awaken this aesthetic sense or had it awakened so we have had centuries of purgation so that your modern man is utterly, uh, utterly um, vagrant, utterly cut off from these uh, symbolic roots. I mean, Carl Jung went blue in the face talking about this. And so they realized that that has made man very weak. So by creating this aesthetic movement and putting in it so many deep archetypal ancient, look at the movie The Fountain. Look how much the tree of life, you know, I'm obsessed with this. Concept. To watch that. that was a weird movie. Remember that? And then, we try, yeah. yeah, we tried watching that, and that movie was just so odd. Yeah, well, very, very, very bizarre movie. Now, one of the central themes in it is this tree of life. I mean, I'm obsessed with that. I've got, I've got a whole thing coming out of that. I've got a whole appendices on it. You know, I mean, and there it is in this movie. It takes central place, not just in this movie, but the religious symbolism of the tree of life goes back unbelievably in many thousands of years. You can find it in the earliest Babylonian symbolism. It's right there in the book of Genesis. And here it is, it is a central character, you know, in this in this uh, modern film, with all this archetypal symbolism around it. So, the people who do this, they know that they have to, every now and again, give you that, I think a good parallel would be, isn't it, that, that um, when you're a drug addict, like a heroin addict, and, and if you declare that you are, you can get free needles and they... Like inject you with some of the heroin or something? Is that what they do? I don't know, Dave. That they they don't do that in the states, but they do that in some parts of the world. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, they give yeah, the method. They they give in the states. They give heroin addicts methadone. Well, that's what they're basically doing with this. For me, when when you see this, they're reinvigorating you, like putting the, I don't know, the metaphor of drugs or the metaphor of a, when you're falling into a complete state of sleep. They give you those. They put that. Uh, I um sulfur in front of your nose, you know, and you wake up sort of again. Yeah, like so, yeah, exactly. It's, 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 that's what it is. It's reminding you, it's, it's re-emboldening you, not enough for you to really get aware again, although, believe me, some of them, some people do get very inspired by this, but on the whole, it's just, you know, get out your popcorn, go and watch uh, something here, you know, fascinating, Star Wars, whatever, you know, good versus evil, you know, 
or all the things we know that these movies contain, throw in a bunch of great symbolism, you know, uh, alchemy, like the end of Star Trek uh, 1, where there's this an amazing meeting of uh, man and woman together, where they transcend and go in to become one. Like, you know, so there we have a concept, uh, uh, I hope your audience is familiar with, androgyny. It turns up endlessly in movies. Very ancient, very powerful, ancient alchemical motif that is embedded in the unconscious. So at the end of that movie, they have this amazing scene where the male and the female literally blend together. You have exactly the same type of scene at the end of Dracula, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, where when she cuts off the head of the, the count, he dies, and then she kills herself, and there's a, or some sort of spiritual nucleation of the male and female, and then the last thing you see is this angelic, androgynous ascent, like a transfiguration taking place, you see. And you have it like, over and over and over again, in various uh, films, this concept of androgyny, and you know, I try to go list uh, these motifs that they're using all the time: the tree of life, uh, you know, the red-headed woman, uh, uh, the red-dressed woman, the woman in the red dress, or whatever it might be, the checkered floor, you name it. These are there because they need to keep you somewhat archetypally. Uh, new, uh, uh, I'm looking for the word like nutrients, or it's it's uh, nourished, right, gotcha. to an extent, just so that you're not so malnutrited that you can't function, you know, that's what it is. But it certainly isn't so that the whole world, they're itching to enlighten the world. Maybe you get that through a, another kind of movie like V for Vendetta. There are certain movies that do fall into the category. I'm not, I'm not... Matrix, V for Vendetta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, and even The Truman Show, I'm, I'm certainly saying that those are movies that are highly artistic, designed to awaken the aesthetic sense, certainly designed to turn you on to some greater, more metaphysical motifs. There's no doubt in my mind that, that is, that's the fact. But there are a lot of other movies as well that are doing the opposite. They're sorcery. They're there to inspire. They're, they're an agenda from a di what's called the Dionysian cult or the group that I. And you mentioned earlier that you watched my Age of Manipulation, so you know that I, I went into this in great detail. Not to mention the more sordid satanic cults that are involved, but just in general this uh, cult of Dionysus, whose job it is to put solar cult androgynous celebs in front of us, the Mick Jaggers. Uh, David Bowie's, who else? Jim Morrison, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And the even more ridiculous versions today. That andro that's another version, uh, again, to keep an iconic. These actually, these men, solar children, represent Mithras. They actually represent the very gods that these Illuminati adore. And when I mean adore, I mean worship. I mean really worship these guys. So they will make a little myth. They'll create a hero, like an Elvis or whoever. And that being will jump through the hoops in the very same way that you were speaking of Jim Carrey doing, will live out in his movies or his music or in some other even scenario, will live out the life drama of, of one of these potentates that they actually worship. Like literally live out the life of Horus or live out the... Of course, it'll be in some ball. Yeah, sun, sun symbolism in the case of Elvis, right? There you go. Right. Absolutely. And again, some of it happens autonomously. And the rest of it is very contrived. I'd say that now it's, it's almost entirely contrived. But remember, even if it wasn't contrived, this happens. Myths happen. So they've, no, they're, 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 they've, no, they've noticed this. They've noticed that in ancient times it happened automatically. And now all they do is they just make a sort of a simulacra, a simulated version so that you know, all, the, all the girls or whatever will identify with it or whatever. And then the fashions will start up and then, you know, whatever it might be. They know that the certain kind of psyche that is more eclectic, that's more synthetic, that's more right brain, Put these heroes in front of the media and the, and the commercials and the Levi ads and you name it all in the magazines, and that will do the trick. And people will not have a faintest idea of what is being communicated by way of these advertisements for genes or whatever it might be. You know, it's just unbelievable when you get into it. And if you've seen my age of manipulation, you'll know that it's a such. I think you said earlier yourself, it's such a huge field. How can any one DVD or presentation cover it? You, one of my biggest problems is people always email me going, oh, yeah, I wish you'd have talked more about that. And here's me, yeah, I wish I could have done. But, you know, I mean, there's only so many hours I can, even me, even I can stand up on, on a stage but without dropping. You know, it's just so lengthy. It's so in-depth. And then, again, I can't do it all. My point is to make a lot of, uh, you know, suggestions and show people the way. But, you know, really, they got to go up and uh, do it themselves. I provided the information. I provided the sources. People need to get into it and really understand this, how this works for two reasons. One is to take the power away from the sorcerer, and two is to use it yourself for positive reasons. 
Uh, I had a I had a question for you. It's kind of a maybe a little bit of a personal question. I see a lot of similarities in electronic dance music today and like ancient tribal sounds. And I was just wondering, uh, do you personally listen to electronic music? Um, yeah, I, I like trance music a lot. I like the Orb and the Future Sounds of London and uh, yeah. and uh, you know even Tangerine Dream and a, a, a certain amount of. Uh, 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 you know, like a Van Gallis and even yeah. what's his name? Oh, there's so many. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm a big fan of <laughs> trance music and like a lot more psychedelic, uh, like the harder, you know what I'm saying? Like almost like an infected mushroom. Yeah, and electronic. Uh, I like industrial. I like industrial music. Sure. <laughs> I like I like it. In fact, I like any music that has that mantric rhythm, rhythmic stuff, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's in a more industrial metal type of thing or even more trance music. There's, I adore that kind of music a lot. I listen more symphonic. Well, I'm I'm a musician. That's why I I, I wanted to ask that question because I I heard the song that you played during the Free Your Mind with the symbolism and you're like you had the different pictures and one was going into another and you like you can see the correlations through all these symbols and I was just that's what sparked my my question. Yeah, um, I, I tried to put as much of that music into my own documentaries as possible because I listen to it a lot and it's, it's very right brain, it's very stream of consciousness and it's music that allows you to dive in okay. where you're, you know, you're more personally involved. It's not uh, linear and it's not a song necessarily with lyrics or a structured, you know, sort of sort of twenty, a three minute song or whatever. So it allows you to go in there and it's, it's why I like it a lot is because I work so hard that if I, if I play just three minute songs, yeah. You know, you go stir crazy listening, even if, even songs you really like. Yeah. Whereas if, if you put on the the, the trance music, mm -hmm. you know, it's different every time. Every time you put that same piece on, you're hearing more in it, and it doesn't become as boring. Yeah, of course. Like you hear the different layerings of the different yeah. sounds and you're always they hearing different come together. For instance, when I used to do uh, retail and uh, working in bookstores and what have you, and we'd always try to slip the, we'd try to slip the trance music on when the boss was out because then your day goes by faster because if you're listening to these very uh, formulaic kinds of music, it becomes very monotonous and you almost feel more tense. Yeah. You know. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, well, hey, you know, we've pretty much almost taken up two hours of your time, but, uh, I mean, it's been great. Eye-opening, very inspiring. Um, well, one other quick question I had easy to answer is, Excluding your own work, just for the sake of the question, um, what would you say, if you had to narrow it down, be the three most important books that someone could read? Well, uh, certainly top of the list would be, like, uh, in my eyes, I'd say that uh, Dr. John Coleman, any of his work is, is highly recommended. A book by uh, Webster Tarpley and Lyndon LaRouche crowd called Dope Incorporated, because it specifically shows you the British connections of how America is run by the British oligarchy. That is a piece that is so important to know about. It not only takes you back to the time of the Constitution, what have you, but it also explains what's going on in today's world, who these presidents are, you know, how they come to power, the kind of uh, treachery. Uh, it also explains where these federal orgs come about and the world control from an American point of view. And um, uh, why I say this is because Americans are usually quite well up to speed on the that there is a conspiracy. They beat the world knowing that there's a conspiracy, but many of them have not made the transition yet to know how the British aristocracy uh, factor in. They think they're free and the British has got nothing to do with it. It's extremely important that they read Dr. John Coleman and uh, Dope Incorporated from people like Webster Tarpley. Uh, those are highly recommended. And then satellite to that is, of course, then the G. Edward Griffin, uh, who do speak about the same thing, and uh, Eustace Mullins, uh, that kind of thing. And those are, are crucial. Uh, there's so many others I can mention and have listed. If people go to my articles and look at the Constitution Con article or look at the Weapons of Mass Destruction found article, go to the bottom and you'll find all these authors that I list. Uh, but since you asked me that question right now, those are the ones I can think of. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a guy called, uh, uh, he wrote the book uh, Treason in America, Anthony Chaitkin. Uh, an incredibly important book there, you know, so there's a, uh, because you are speaking just about the conspiracy aspect, right? Well, yeah, I mean, well, just in your opinion, since you have such a much more broad understanding of all the, all the material, be it, you know, symbolism, be it control, or even just historical hidden knowledge, um, uh -huh. you know, if someone was really looking to dive, dive in, you know, what's, what's, where's a good, 
uh, jumping off point. I'm sure all those books are a great, great jumping off points. Um, I would recommend my own work because I've tried to synthesize just for that very reason. Right. Uh, actually, that's why I love your work because you do that and you also, you know, you give your sources all the time, every time, you know, and you, even in this talk alone, in this two hour talk, we've, I, you know, I'm going to have to go back. I've probably got a thousand hours of material now to go and research just based on all the references to other work, which I think is great. I don't have that type of memory to be able to do that. <laughs> well, I just do it all the time. I don't really have a good memory either, but the thing is I just do it all the time. But you see, then if you say, say somebody was wanting to st study the symbolism thing, I'd have a whole bunch of different authors for them. Say they were interested in the history of Christianity, uh, the Templars, you know. I, I have gone through all of this subject matter all my life and have been able to synthesize the best of the best. I mean, actually by reading it. So, you know, I read maybe 20 books a week, uh, 20 books a month, excuse me. And therefore, over the years, just by the simple act of doing that, you find out who is just utterly worthless or only half good and who is absolutely bloody marvelous, you know. So say I was talking about Egypt or, you know, then, you, then or the Bible, then I got my Tony Bushby's and my Ralph Ellis's and Mustafa Gadala's and Ackerman Osman's, you know, so it depends from which school you're coming. If you're talking more on the psychological aspect, then you have, you know, different people to recommend and, uh, and all of this. Uh, symbolism, of course, is very, very important, so you have different people to recommend there. Judaism, the history of Judaism, I can save people, you know, centuries there, you know, by recommending things that they should read. So it's, uh, it's about ec eclectically having your Fingers on the pulse of all of this different subject matter because I'm not an, I'm not a narrow guy. I don't get only fanatical about one area and beat that to death because then you become sort of partisan. Then you become sort of obsessed. And by the moment that you do that, you're missing other key information over here that you may not be interested in. And this is also what's happening a lot in this uh, movement. Like for instance, you know, you barely see anyone in this revisionist movement ever talking about philosophy or psychology and very few ever talking about catastrophism. And they should be. And it would help their work to do so. When I first came into the movement, nobody but nobody was even speaking about Ireland uh, and the incredible reservoir of knowledge that you get from studying the Irish Celts, uh, not the Celts, but the Irish and then the Celts and so on. You know, so there's, as I said, it's because it's partly early days yet and half the greatest books on any of these subjects have only come out within a very short period of time. Remember I was saying about the healing and that we were in a short, early period of time? That's also corroborated by the fact that some of the greatest discoveries have only been made in about the last 20, 30 years. And even some people could argue within 20 years. Some of the great authors I would mention, their books have only been out, including my own, within a very, very short period of time. So again, you know, even though there's been great champions before, um, it, it, it's only now, especially in the field of Judaism, for instance, right now we have many Jews themselves blowing the whistle on, on, on the lie of Israel and on the lie of, you know, the Israelites. Jewish men, people I can mention and have mentioned. Actually, Jewish authors themselves, like Shlomo Sand and, and others, who are coming out from within these or, organizations and showing you, yeah, it's built on lies, it's built, built on mind control. There isn't any science to back it up, and the science that's been handed to you is bogus science. It's all propaganda, you know. There's a huge propaganda uh, machinery at loose in the world. So... Um, the one thing I will say is that, yeah, I do, in fact, read the books. I just don't read, like, a comment or two on some Amazon website or whatever. You know, I really buy the books. I read them. I study them meticulously and uh, try to then summarize the best parts of the book. So if people go to my Astral Theology site or the Irish Origin site and go to those appendices areas, they will see very detailed summaries of some great books, you know, that would cost a lot for people to buy and, and a hell of a lot of time to read. And even if you did read it, you might not even be able to, you know, summarize or realize why this book is important. I've done that work myself for a lot for people to go on the, my websites and check it out. And on a little bit lesser level on the forum, I try to do the same thing, you know. Uh, so, but but that certainly does mean that I have my I do have my favorite authors. There's some pretty standard authors that are absolutely crucial. I mean, absolutely crucial to know about. I'm excited to go and check it all out. I mean, I've checked out obviously in this week since talking to you. I've been just hitting your material as hard as possible because I mean I asked you I, after watching Architects and Control and I was shocked that you were you know willing to come on the show and talk to us about this stuff and it's great I appreciate it immensely um, but uh, I guess to wrap it up and let you carry on with your day just to wrap it up like what are you working on right now lots of things as I said the tree of life I'm trying to get that together 
Um, we're revising all of, of my three books, doing a, just a normal update on those and various DVD projects, slowly working on those. I mean, a lot of online stuff. So it's, it's unbelievable, you know, it's not a moment to, there's not even a moment to blink, you know, it's just such a busy time right now. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this because this is very educational for me. So I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you, and we'll certainly, you know, if you're up to it, we'll do it again. There's a lot of other areas to go into, you know, so I'd be happy to. Um, it's always a pleasure for me, you see, to speak with people who actually know things and, and have good questions about it as opposed to hosts who really don't have a clue, you know, or, and, and haven't got the right motives. You know, it appears to people that I do a lot of interviews, and in fact, I actually do not do a lot of conferences or interviews for the very purpose of, you know, that the people just don't have integrity or they're out for themselves or what it might be. So, you know, I'm always glad to come on when there is knowledge there and there's an the eagerness. So, you know, thank you for giving me that time as well. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm obviously a layman. We're both laymen, but, you know, we have an incredible interest and, I mean, I feel fulfilled <laughs> of course. Well, see, I'm also a layman. I always maintain and say clearly that I am no expert on any of these things. The jury is always out. I could be wrong in everything. We're all in a pro In fact, so much of my work is collaborative. People send me stuff on a daily basis, sometimes, you know, hundreds and hundreds of things a week. That's one thing. And secondly, I'm always keeping an open mind. I always think that, yeah, what I've seen and what I've learned, you know, of course, you, you, you proceed by assuming that you're right. Otherwise, you couldn't move out of bed in the morning. But you always keep the intellectual openness to realize that not only could you be completely wrong, but you need to always be think you always need to be actively thinking about the opposite position that you're taking. And I do that a lot. And I think a lot of people do not do this. They become obsessed, you know. But I don't. I, I I'm very uh, strong when I advocate what I believe to be the case. But I always personally keep an open mind to say, yeah, well, maybe that's completely the opposite. In fact, what is the opposite? Let me study that. And then, as I said, by going through all of these different books that come out, I'm also very aware of all the disinformation. I'm also very aware that if you don't do what I do and you don't help people go to the right sources, they're going to probably be swamped with all of this disinformation because now that the force, <clears throat> now that the big brother has understood that there's a gigantic movement throughout the world looking for this truth and digging deeply, they have unleashed their own robots through the publishing orgs to write books that apparently are also revelatory in nature. And this goes right across the board. I don't care if it's about Judaism or the Knights Templar or the Magdalene and the Grail and whatever else. And yet those books are loaded with disinformation to put you off on the wrong track. So it's very, my work is also very deconstructive in that way as well, is to point you in the direction of the great minds that you totally need to have in your library, but also to be kind of wary of those who are unleashed by the beast, so to speak, to have extremely high-level publishing deals. And this even goes for the media. This even goes for the type of uh, shows that are now being produced on BBC and PBS in America that are dabbling into this occult stuff that Jordan Maxwell and others and myself have been dealing with for years and years and years. They're literally plagiarizing it, directly plagiarizing it, and then putting it on there with their own little goon and then trying to tell, you know, going out to the millions who have never seen this before and then believe that, Oh, isn't it wonderful that the BBC have finally told us the truth about Jesus and the crucifixion or the, the cults of the ancient world? And though that, that poor guy sitting there in suburbia hasn't the faintest idea that people lived and died and sweated blood to bring that knowledge out from the recesses of the underworld, you know. But now you click on your remote control and there's, a, you know, BBC doing it or the Discovery Channel doing it. So that also needs to be taken in mind. Is I'm glad the information is out better than not being out. But at the same time, it's the means by which it's coming up. Yeah. So you're asking me about, oh, yeah, you know, you're a layman and you just have this radio show. It's crucial that people with integrity who will even have a person like me or Jordan on, yeah. you don't even know the good that you're doing. Because right now, our knowledge is being eclipsed and plagiarized and appropriated by the mainstream who are taking, who are doing it precisely so that people like us don't get our time on, on mainstream television. They're absolutely making sure that our voice doesn't reach the public. And, they, and one of the ways to do that is to homogenize the knowledge. I know it sounds strange if you're not familiar with this, but this is what they do. The mainstream is, plays a game. It walks in rhythm with you to find out. It always has its uh, fingers on the pulse of what's happening in the underworld because it knows that that's where the mavericks are. That's where if those people were given 10 minutes of TV time, right. the world would change on its axis, man. Mm -hmm. So they cut you off at the pass, so to speak. So in order for me to have a, you know, two hours to speak, freely and openly and without censorship 
on any public format is to me a very, very brilliant thing. It's not to be underestimated at all. So again, you know, you should feel good about that. Yeah, it's the age, the age of it, the age of the internet. It allows yeah. That to happen. Exactly. Well, anyway, guys, thank you very much again, and, and you know, anytime. Sure do- yeah, yeah, like this was it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Thank Have a you. good day. You too. Best of luck with the show. Uh, you'll be able to get me a copy, right? Oh, sure, yeah. I'll, I'll send you a link when it's up. Thanks, mate. Okay. Yeah.